Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Elizabeth Nolan Brown, staff editor at Reason.com and a contributor to Libertarianism.org. Libertarianism often seems like a boys' club. I mean one poll says that two-thirds of self-identified libertarians are men, which is actually precisely the number we've got in this room right now. <laughs> um, why do you think that is? Um, hi. First of all, I'm happy to be here talking with you guys about this today. Um, I obviously have my – I have pet reasons why uh, that I think that that is. But I mean there's no actual – there's no real data on it. I think one of the things that's kind of cool though is that if you look at the younger libertarians, especially involved in like campus groups or in Students for Liberty and in the, in the post-collegiate groups, the, the ratio seems to be a lot more women heavy. There seems to be a lot more equal between men and women. And um, I, so I think it's, a, I think it's a, a, a philosophy that's starting to appeal to more women. Is there anything about what we used to do uh, maybe before that kept women off? Uh, broadly speaking, we as libertarians before any of us were probably doing this in the 70s were we particularly bad, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't mean – I don't know. If you talk to some of the – I'm involved with the Association of Libertarian Feminists and if you talk to some of the um, the women, the older women there who have been around in the movement for a while, they will talk about it being kind of a, a boys club and kind of exclusionary. Um, I think more so than anything that you know male libertarians do, it's just that there's sometimes been a lack of representation of you know certain issues that are important to women. So certain uh, areas that may be good entry points to libertarianism for women just haven't really been out there. And meanwhile, you know, a lot of people come to libertarianism through like an economics class or a political science class or law, and those are still fields that men are more heavily represented in, so are more going into. So, you know, that maybe just means a lot more men are exposed have traditionally been exposed to libertarian ideals than than women have been. What would some of those good avenues for women to come to libertarianism be? Um, well, I mean, I think I think that focusing on reproductive freedom issues is a good start, which includes things like abortion access, but also includes you know over the counter birth control, includes things like surrogacy issues. It's actually a whole lot of issues surrounding birth and pregnancy and the way that that's treated and the things that pregnant women can be compelled to do that a lot of the libertarian women I know are very active in, and then that's an issue that you know a lot of liberal feminists are also active in, or just you know general feminists are active in. So I think that's one area where you can kind of capture – you could maybe you know, get women interested. Is there a difference between the way that libertarians would approach those issues and the liberal democrats would? Because obviously it seems like women would be drawn mostly to the liberal democrats over say the republicans on those issues. But what would attract them to libertarianism per se over the democrats? I think it depends on the issues. Um, I think on you know on things like birth issues, on things on you know not having the state be able to, you know, f or order a pregnant woman into treatment for eight months because you know someone reported her drinking or something like that. And I think some in the parenting issues, I don't think that there is much of a difference. So. I think a lot of times women, especially younger women that are feminist minded, just gravitate naturally towards Democrats and liberals because they think, you know, they're not Republicans, obviously. They're not social conservatives, so they don't want that. And they might have libertarian sympathies and, and other totally unrelated issues, but they just don't see that as a viable option until you start talking to them about how you can be a libertarian and also care about, you know, we care about these things too. And there's, you know, we can be active in these sort of issues as well. Yeah, it helps if you don't spend all your time talking about monetary policy, which is great <laughs> it is, doesn't actually appeal to that many people in general. But I was kind of thinking of, of three reasons that I've heard discussed a lot for why there are relatively fewer women libertarians. One is that we're, men are particularly bad at talking to women for certain reasons, uh, which I think is sometimes true depending on the, the kind of men that libertarianism attracts. Does that, does that ever strike you as a possible reason? Uh, I mean that's kind of one of the classic ones you hear. But again, I, I, don't, I don't experience that as much and I don't think that necessarily among the younger generations that is true. I think that that stereotype about the kind of you know, dorky libertarian guy who can't interact in social situations is also maybe more of a relic of when it was more fringe ideology. And now that it is attracting a wider audience, you see really all sorts of you know, men and women that are interested in it. And another one that I often hear is is actually kind of uh, based on 
uh, this is probably the most controversial, some sort of congenital cognitive element. You've heard some people make these arguments that there's something about women's brains possibly that make them They're less too emotional, less abnormal, not enough, not too rational emotional. enough, that sort of thing. And I often say, you know, that if that is true on any level, you know, it would be that boys are four times more likely to have autism. <laughs> so that might explain it by itself, but it also seems a kind of like a bad explanation. Well, I mean, I know that there is some research that men in general are more inter- interested in fringe ideologies across the board, and maybe the autism thing has a role to play there or whatever, but for whatever reason that men or, are more likely. But I think also that, again, it's just somewhat a matter of exposure. And as you see libertarians start to appeal to broader interests and, and be more widespread, then you're going to see all personality types to it. So I think if that was a thing, then it's not I, – I don't think that there's anything inherent in libertarianism that makes it not appeal to women. And I think when you look at data on, you know, the, on the gender breakdowns on a lot of issues, there's no, there's no strong you know, uh, gender imbalance in, in how men and women think about a lot of the social issues that we think of as – or the issues we think of as being important to libertarianism. And then the third one is uh, is also pretty controversial but you've heard more social conservatives say things like this but that women are more beholden to the welfare state uh, and Sandra Fluke would obviously be like an example who was resoundingly criticized as being someone asking for more things from the state. Uh, does that reason strike you as, a, as plausible? I think again that it's something that might be true but not a given. I think that the way that feminism has played out in the past few decades, um, you know, or and, and the way that outreach to women in politics, especially from the Democrats, has played out, has sort of emphasized a state role in helping women. And you know, for for the average person who's not spending a ton of time thinking about political ideology, you know, you're not you just kind of yeah do react to these incentives to the to the culture around you, and it seems like okay, this is a party that wants to help women. But I think once you when people are more interested, and when you start talking talking to people about how – just about libertarian ways to help women too and why we are actually interested in helping people and not just like maximizing profits or things, then then you can kind of change that view that they have to be supporting liberals if they want to be supporting women. So how how do libertarians help women? <laughs> I mean it's in terms of what, it, what are you talking about? Uh, in any way, how does libertarianism help women? The difficulty here I think is, is some of the things that you mentioned uh, like so you use access to birth control – access to, to reproductive freedom type of issues have a very obvious uh, state intervention element right. to this, correct? Uh, so that seems to be the first obvious question, answer is, to, well, the state needs to make sure that there's access to these things. And then the second one would be to have some other non-state thing. So how can some of these issues, how do libertarians view some of these issues such as access to reproductive care? I think there's a lot of issues where a libertarian ideology or philosophy really dovetails nicely with what what would be the best policies for women, which are you know removing all sorts of regulatory restrictions to um, reproductive care, including access to birth control and uh, including you know by making it available over the counter, including abortion clinics that aren't regulated so heavily that they have to close down and things like that. I mean that's a really obvious area where libertarian uh, you know dislike of the state being involved in, in over regulating things is is a is naturally part of sort of a pro-woman agenda. Let me ask you about something that we've been asked before about the abortion issue. We've – when we – every now and then we'll put out to our audience on Facebook and Twitter, what questions do you have about libertarianism and we'll do an episode answering them. And a question that pops up pretty frequently is do you have to be pro-choice to be a libertarian? And we know that there's – I mean there's a sizable number of women who are not pro-choice. So is there some – do you have to be pro-choice to be a libertarian? Is that kind of if, if a woman's listening to this or, or a man, someone who is say pro-life listening to this, is, are we saying nope, you can't, you know, this, this isn't for you? No, I mean and I think that you find a lot of disagreement about about the issue of abortion within the libertarian movement and it's not split down gender lines. I don't think it's more like more women are more pro-choice than men or vice versa. I've actually been trying to get some answers about this on Facebook just this week because a, a discussion sort of cropped up and um, a lot of the libertarian men that responded were saying that they were personally pro-choice even if they were – even if they were not necessarily you know, morally in favor of abortion, they didn't think it was – it should be you know, illegal. And I think that's a position that you find um, among libertarians 
happens a lot. But I think one of the things, but I think there are a lot of libertarians who, are, men and women, who are unabashedly pro-choice, including you know myself and a lot of my colleagues. I reason. And I think, and a lot of the people that I'm involved with in the Association of Libertarian Feminists, and I think one of the things is we often shy away from talking about reproductive issues because it's like, well, that is an area where libertarians disagree a lot. Best just leave it alone. And I think that, I mean, that's something I, I want to change. And I think that's something that a lot of, some of the women that I talk to want to change too. But you, the difficulty there, of course, is that there is also a whether it's good or bad, I'm not going to value, but a cogent libertarian argument for pro-life like, right. in terms of protection of rights. So if we need to get more libertarians on board with pro-choice, that might be difficult in and of itself if that's a way to sell things uh, along the way. I don't even think it's necessarily a matter of getting more libertarians to, to you know, change their beliefs and become pro-choice if they're not because, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not uh, in the business of, you know, trying to elect politicians who are going to do this or whatever. I mean, I think it's more just an issue of if you are a pro-choice libertarian, being able to talk about those issues and being able to advocate your position on these issues and put it out there without feeling like you should just avoid the topic because it is divisive. I mean, it's going to remain divisive, I think. And my goal isn't to try and like win. I mean, if, if you do kind of win some people over, they're cool. But if not, I mean, that's not the underlying issue, I don't think. It seems that another, another issue uh, that we've kind of mentioned a little bit, but um in terms of women's issues, and something you've written a lot about is also sex work and and how state regulations or prohibitions of sex work uniquely affect women in certain ways. Um, and this is something where the libertarian way is kind of a third way compared to what you hear from the left and right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I write about yeah I write about sex work and sex worker rights and decriminalizing prostitution a lot. And I think this is a really good area where. I think especially among older feminists, you used to see a lot of, you know, that were very anti-prostitution. But since, uh, I don't know, the 90s or so, there's been a very strong, you know, pro-sex worker rights, pro, you know, that that's a valid choice that people make. And and even if you necess even if you don't necessarily support it morally or think it should exist, even that the state coming in and criminalizing it and getting the police involved and all that just creates more problems and makes it more dangerous and you know harms the welfare of everyone involved. So I think that that is a position that a lot of mainstream liberal feminists would even agree with today, but there's just not a lot of people talking about that. And so the libertarian position of, you know, of being naturally skeptical of police and uh, of you know law enforcement and criminalizing things is is a good way to come about that. Let me ask about about this because it's a it's a position that is certainly not widely held um, that we should we should legalize prostitution um, and it's also one that's I mean fairly shocking to a lot of people um, and they think of course we shouldn't because it's exploitive to women you know you you legalize this and more women are going to be forced into it um, and it radically degrades their quality of life and it's and women dangerous aren't yes. um, so I mean what's the answer to those people who are coming at it not from a this is a moral wrong we need to ban it but a you know this is this is a deeply harmful thing that we need to try to stop Right, which is where I think a lot of people come from. And I think that can be a really sort of seductive first viewpoint too for, for young women who are kind of coming at the issue, especially when you have a lot of people in, involved in sort of industries that are saving sex workers from sex trafficking, which, which sounds like a good thing but um, and, and, and obviously can be. But you have a lot of people where it's kind of become a, an industry so they're – promoting the most sort of salacious stories to make the issue seem bigger than it is. And one way they do that is sort of by defining all people who are working in – all sex workers, all people who are working in prostitution as sex trafficking victims when they make up these stats. So it sort of sounds like it's this huge problem and then when you actually sort of look at how they define things, it actually turns out you know, they're – sort of totally denying that a lot of people actually do this by choice and there might be some coercion involved or not. But you know, um, since I've started writing about sex work at Reason, I've come to know like a lot more sex workers and sex work activists, especially online. And they're, they're very active in wanting to promote the idea that they do this by choice and this is a valid option and that sex work is work and that even you know whatever your qualms about it, by criminalizing it, you're only hurting the people that are you know actually involved in the industry and the people that they're claiming to help. But there's a commodification element here because we're, we're – for some – Feminists, I would say, more on the left, where we'd be creating markets in women. We're creating a market for sex traffic. It's kind of like 
child labor or just sort of things that should not be sold type of issue, which you can hear from the left too. And then of course the idea that as soon as you get into it on the on the sale side, on the choice side, um, you're now trafficking in in illicit wear. So uh, why don't we just ban? I mean, we do this a lot of that. We don't allow sales of organs, for example. So we just mm-hmm. ban it because it's a, it's commodifying something that shouldn't be commodified. I think it's, but I think it's kind of best to look at it kind of like we look at the drug trade, which I think a lot of people will understand with the drug trade that maybe you don't want people doing certain drugs, but especially that criminalizing them just ends up and putting them on the black market just ends up leading to more violence and ends up leading to a lot of police abuse and ends up leading to people in jail that maybe shouldn't be that could just be you know turning their life around. So I think when you people see that with drugs and I think it's sort of the same thing with prostitution. Even if you – I mean obviously we want to stop sex trafficking. But part of the reason that's hard is because all prostitution, even the people that are willingly engaging in it, has to be sort of clandestine and underground because it's all illegal. So if that was legal, then it would be a much easier actually to root out the illegal – the people who are doing things illegally and actually, you know – Trafficking people into this against their consent, because that would be still illegal. But you don't have, right, you right. Don't okay, creating a sex market. trafficking, of course, would still be illegal. You know, like forcing anyone into the sex trade. You know, trafficking. Er, you know, selling underage people would still obviously be illegal. And I think it'd be easier to to punish, find and punish those people if you weren't criminalizing. You know, cons- adults that were consensually paying to have sex with one another. But I was thinking more on the lines of of critics of marketplaces in general, like sweatshops. Like the problem here is that these people feel like they have to do this and there's something non-voluntary about the choice because of the conditions that they're in, which is a much more yeah. left – coming from the left type of and I mean, Yeah, and obviously I, I disagree with that and most libertarians would. But I'm, again, I'm not necessarily interested in convincing those people that they're wrong and that – in that view. I mean I, I think that there is no convincing some people in that and they're going to think that no matter what. And so I wouldn't you know, say that, OK, fine, like try to – End this as a practice, but in the meantime, as a means of harm reduction, you know, making it illegal makes life more dangerous, makes life conditions more dangerous, makes life more exploitative for the people who are who they think are forced into this industry. So at least you know, removing the the, the state sort of barrier there. You you keep saying you know maybe we can we don't necessarily need to see this as correct in a in a moral sense, or we don't need to you know endorse the behavior, but the making it illegal is worse makes things worse and we could we could get rid of that step without going to the additional step of of endorsement and that that's an issue that i see a lot of people questioning about certain aspects certain you know subsects within libertarianism um, that there's this they see this idea that by making things legal by say you know ending the war on drugs or ending um, illegal prostitution that we are endorsing it, that this this represents kind of a, a stamp of approval on these behaviors. And at the same time, you see some people who identify as libertarian kind of taking that position too and saying, yes, like we ought not to judge. It's, it's not just that we shouldn't – the state shouldn't pro- prohibit these behaviors, taking drugs, having sex for money, whatever else, but that we as a society should embrace them, should not look down upon them, should not judge them harshly and that that potentially turns off some people including women especially from a those from a conservative perspective is that is that a legitimate critique of libertarianism or certain aspects of libertarianism is that is it true is that something that they kind of have to you know the conservatives and everyone else has to get over and we need to just embrace these other lifestyles I mean, I think you definitely have some of that within libertarianism. I think you definitely have some of that on the left too. And um, I, I don't think it's something you can say we need to move away from because there will always be some people that are going to feel like that, and that's that's fine. That's one position to have on this. I think that I mean, I try not to emphasize yeah that sort of issue. I think that from a practical standpoint and from the standpoint of trying to attract more people to a wider audience to libertarianism that sort of emphasizing the practical benefits and the, the especially the harm reduction benefits of some of these things over the sort of like libertine like everybody should you know have the choice to do what they want with their bodies or whatever is is I mean it's just another way to go about it I don't think one is more right than wrong I just think it depends on what your purpose is I think Aaron's question is good though because we have seen this thing of of the uh, Everything that's prohibited should actually be made first legal and then secondly, 
not criticized. And this is a new right. this is somewhat of a new thing with this the quote unquote slut shaming type of idea, shaming people for being polyamorous or a lot of things that that libertarians seem more likely to endorse. And or we should young libertarians. Young, this yeah, seems yeah. to be a characteristic of which seems to be highly related to kind of more left wing impulses about power rather than just government. Maybe, but I mean, one of the areas where this also seems to me to uh, relate is is food policy and nutrition and things like that. And you know, libertarians are obviously very involved uh, against uh, the government sort of banning various foods because they're unhealthy or we don't because they don't want them to eat them. And um, I'm like a total nutrition nerd, and I really believe in healthy eating, and I really think that you know a lot of the things that people have the impulse to ban, like I think people shouldn't eat these things. I think I think people should pay attention to calorie counts and all these things, but I don't want to use the government force to, to make these changes. So I sort of relate in that same way. I mean I think I, I, I think you can promote certain norms without requiring the government to step in. And that's sort of the same thing when yeah. it comes to, to the sort of sexual issues. And you probably should, because that's right. a, that's the other thing too about this is that we uh, a normless society is not going to happen, of course. The the people who are advocating not shaming or criticizing or judging people's decisions as like a sex worker, for example, are advocating their own sort of norms of the way they think society should function, which might be important in this face of non-prohibition. We might need more shaming rather than less yeah. on certain things. I think, I think in, in libertarianism or any political group, there's sort of a – there's this tendency to want to conflate like change, norms and political um, objectives and we should be separating them a lot more. I think you don't necessarily have to subscribe yeah, to certain norms to to believe that you know the, the government shouldn't be banning things or whatever. Yeah, and I think that's a general uh, move. The move here I see is coming mostly out of – Basically, postmodern thought. I mean, something Aaron and I have studied together: the the idea of looking at at the look, the shaming, the people who who turn away as being its own sort of oppression. And a lot of people have now gone to school, doing English degrees, having done this stuff. So now we're looking at power more than just the state in its own way. And that's another example of how we got into, in terms of prostitution, uh, one way when they tried to combat this was the John. Shaming, right? The focusing right. on the purchasers, which is interesting in and of itself. That being oppressive, right? The the purchasing of the prostitute was the oppressive act. Right. I mean, that's sort of one big strain of thought in, in with people who want prohibition of prostitution is that you know that it's inherently exploitative, and that's why we should criminalize buying sex but not selling it. Um, that's sort of supposed to be the new, like, compassionate way to think about it. But it this this conflation of We've got we've got norms on the one hand that may or may not be correct, but if they are correct, they need to be enforced in some way. And then the conflation of that that need for societal norms with the state seems to be the. I mean, that we've we've brought this up a lot on the on the podcast, going back to our very first one on the difference between society and state. This seems to be one of kind of it's it's shocking that it is an insight that people don't seem to grasp it as much but it seems to be one of the insights of libertarianism is that these things aren't the same thing right. and that there's a world of difference between saying we are going to look down upon you for this behavior or we're going to encourage you to do something different or we're going to I mean outright ostracize you or, or not want you around you know take it to this really high level but that there is there's an extraordinary difference between that and the move that so many on the left and right seem willing to make of taking even the most minor, you know, we, we don't think you should have a large soda with your lunch, and turning that into a permission for the state to use violence against right. which just we, we're taking all of our norms and injecting really awful right. violence into, into them. them. Um, and it's it's shocking that we just we can't we can't seem to recognize that, and so we end up in these situations where I don't I don't like this person doing this thing with this other person, so I want to hold a gun to their face to make them stop. Right, and one of my hopes is that there are a lot of women who identify with some of the the you know goals or projects of mainstream feminism right now, in that some of these different things should be you know uh, promoted that we that we shouldn't be letting that people shouldn't be spreading pictures of their uh, exes naked online. Or that street harassment is bad, or or whatever. Um, you know that we should you know teach young people about sexual consent, but without you know like you said, without stepping in and bringing the power.
power of the state to enforce those norms. And I think that there probably are a lot of people out there who would want to, you know, be involved in who would agree with libertarians on that, but who just necessarily who don't see libertarianism as a philosophy that embraces those issues at all. So when you talk about some of the young people and them bringing in all these different things, I mean, I think that's cool. I don't, I don't discourage. I think there's a lot of people who will also say, you know, there's no room for a libertarian to talk about these sort of ancillary issues and you know, building norms and and you know, non-state oppressiveness. But I think I think talking about it is fine, and it's really kind of that uh, credit to the younger libertarians that they are embracing this sort of stuff that it is broadening interest in the movement. It's just yeah, important to draw lines about what is kind of a political goal, what is inherent to libertarianism and what is just something that we can bring a libertarian viewpoint, which is kind of how I look at like feminism is like I can bring a libertarian viewpoint to feminism or I can bring a feminist viewpoint to libertarianism, but they're not you know, inherently connected. But I think at the same time, you've got this situation where because we're embedded in the society that so often doesn't distinguish the norm issue from the state and law and violence issue that yes, the – that there's – it can turn off the, the feminists from libertarianism because they are – they want to see the state take action. But at the same time, you said that you know, there, there are libertarians who say we shouldn't talk about these ancillary issues and I think they're, I think they're largely wrong. But um, I think that in their defense, when you are spending all of your time in a society where the political conversation almost always takes the form of this sort of thing should meet with disapproval, therefore law against it, you're kind of primed to see any discussion about disapproval or approval as a proxy for a conversation about whether we should have state laws or not. And so when you talk about you know, street harassment. If, if libertarians are saying we shouldn't, you know, women being harassed on the street probably isn't okay. There, there's a sense when, like, well, if you're talking about that, then what you mean is we need to have cops out there locking guys up. I mean, I think that's one of the issues where it's kind of important. It's just an, it's an area where libertarians can inject themselves into the conversation. So when that's a thing that feminists were all talking about and, and then I saw some of the, you know, the younger libertarian women I know who have their blogs, Thoughts on Liberty, um, one of them, you know, writing about it and stepping in and saying like, here's a reason why you might want to think about not criminalizing this and here are alternatives. And the fact that they, they I mean, they could have just ignored it because that's not an issue. But, you know, because they addressed it, then it, it is presenting that issue that, hey, we acknowledge this is a thing that we also think is bad and we would also like to you know, offer an alternative way to look at it. And I think, I mean, that's just one issue. But I think in a lot of areas, there's there's a good way that libertarian libertarian feminists can insert themselves into the conversation just in presenting and trying to break that idea that there is just, there's one way to, if something's bad, then you criminalize it. And then that's the way to look at things. I mean, I think it's it's one of my goals is to try to insert just insert the libertarian view into that conversation. And one of the uh, by capitalizing on what people are already talking about, you know. Oh yeah, one of, one of the things that you've written about too, which is all on this on the same topic about completing state laws with norms or or things that shouldn't be laws, is of course censorship. And in particular, we've seen it with like uh, the recent UK. Uh, porn censorship laws and things like that, which but which is again this weird confluence of the censorship coming from the left and some of them being self-described feminists and also coming from the prudishness of the right t together and working together. So talk, talk a little bit about those laws and, and what they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think it's actually shocking how much you see people sort of embracing uh, a desire to sort of ban offensive speech, ban hate speech, ban which you know is defined as anything that's sort of, you know, racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic and um, it's uh, you know, there's a tendency to kind of be like, well, maybe we're just sort of like blowing this up because you hear about these extraordinary cases from colleges or whatever. But I don't know. I think everyone I talk to is just like, wow, I'm really starting to think that this isn't just a thing of the media sort of blowing this up, that there really is a sort of change on college campuses and amongst like younger thought that this is a legit – and it's not it's, – yeah, it's on the left. It's on the right. It's sort of across the board. Do you have any idea why that is? I mean it's certainly when, – when I was in school – and I mean, Trevor and I were did our undergraduate work at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, which is Berkeley of the yeah. Mountains. I mean, yeah, it's not it's not exactly like the most libertarian place you could find in the country. Um, but I don't recall much of this kind of we got to stop the microaggressions and we have to you know ban all this stuff and no one can be offended. It it just didn't seem in the air. So I'm assuming that this is more of a recent phenomenon. And if so. 
Why? What's wrong with kids today? <laughs> um, I totally just, you know, like uh, what made a cut of thin air theory here is that, I mean, you have a lot of people who didn't see, and, and you know, I was very young, but I still kind of know a little bit about the 90s uh, college atmosphere with the, 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 you know, political correctness and the atmosphere of speech codes on college campuses. And Oberlin tried to do, or not Oberlin, um, Antioch tried to do this sort of affirmative consent thing that we're seeing now. So I think you see a lot of that coming back from people who didn't, not only didn't live through it the first time, but have no, you know, are so far removed from it that they don't remember the excesses of it and how it went too far and kind of became a laughing stock and backfired. And you also have people who have only, you know, kind of had a Democrat in power and have seen sort of gay marriage. I mean, since 2004, since, and, or, since you know, all the gay marriage decisions and we had Bush and it kind of seemed like, uh, you know, if you, were, if you were on the side of uh, liberal social values, then you were losing. And all of a sudden it's been on the upswing. And so we have young people who have only seen it and they think things are only going to get, you know, Obama was elected and things are only going to get better. So it's like – it's a lot of hubris involved in thinking, OK, now we're on the right side of history and now like we know what's correct and we'll just ban these things and it'll be fine because, you know, we're never going to be on the wrong side again. But I mean, that's one of my big ne- things. Next time you're out of power, yeah. it will be used against you. Yeah. Well, you already see – I mean then you already see cops campaigning to get themselves protected by hate speech laws and Wait, hate really? crime that laws. Yeah. happened? Yeah, and they, they, they've been charged under hate crime for anti-cop sentiment and by the NYPD um, for someone springing – NYPD sucks. And they got charged with a hate crime? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, was and a- then there's some. They're trying to get uh, under federal hate speech laws. I think co- as a cop as a protected class too. So you see that if you like create the if you create these laws for the state to use, then obviously people are going to use them in all sorts of ways, and you're not going to approve of all of them, and that's the reason not to do it. <laughs> well, everyone becomes a member of a, of a group in a certain way, and then it's and then it's about protecting your group via right. laws. I, I know that the solution now to your group, whatever it is, cops, redheads, which is a particularly <laughs> oppressed class, I must say. Yes, uh, but one does not deserve <laughs> <protected status. laughs> Libertarians, whatever your group is, you just got to get that put into the law, so now it's illegal right. to criticize you because there's something uniquely bad about criticizing you. Which I think is a again um, another thing we haven't really touched on about maybe some of the reason that feminism in his historically at least since the seventies let's say, although of course three of the big founding members libertarians are of course women Ayn Rand Rose Wilder Lane and uh, Isabella Patterson but but in with the wave of feminism one of the reasons that possibly it tends to the left is because it's it it likes interest group politics. It views women as an interest group. And it, is there anything about that that libertarianism can address, I think, in terms of women being an interest group as opposed to just another rights – another an individual has rights just like men. So therefore, we're all equal as opposed to looking at for special privileges. Um, I think the only thing is that you know what what you said the the latter part of what you said is obviously true that we should look at people as different special interest groups and you know and there's a desire among libertarians to not do that and to just you know look at you know women and men or whoever all together and how it affects them but that doesn't mean that some issues that affect women more aren't proper areas of concern for libertarians like you know reproductive issues or or like sex work you know and I think that because these aren't necessarily women being a special interest group. They're just they're groups that everyone should care about because they're interests of the they're instances of the state using coercion, and you know they're they're so they're things that men and women can come together on without thinking of them as special women's interest groups. So I think there'd be a danger to think of them like that. Just people caring about rights and yeah and responsibility. Yeah, and it's just broadening and it's sort of broadening the scope of, of yeah things that traditionally maybe libertarians have been. But I don't think there's any reason they haven't been other than they just sort of haven't been. Uh, there haven't been enough people to push them in there. But on this topic of of groups and oppressed groups, I mean, it, it is the case that historically women as a group have been fairly oppressed, um, and in many parts of the world still are to a horrific degree. Um, and so, on on the the questions of like censorship of say pornography if if they're if they're correct the people who want to censor are correct that it's degrading to women in some way or um, the making prostitution illegal for similar reasons is there an argument to be made that the because the because women were were so oppressed for so long that we can't just kind of step away and enter a kind of libertarian paradise of everyone gets to do whatever they want as long as they don't violate rights because the scales have been so far tipped and so what we need is government to enter the picture and ban these kinds of behaviors that are still operating to keep 
women down and that maybe maybe someday when things – I mean this is the argument for affirmative action in college admissions too, that maybe someday when things have evened out more, then we can lift these, these restrictions, lift these laws, lift these censorious acts and let things go. But until things are fair, it's – you'd still be hurting women even yeah. in this free society. I mean I think you'll have people make that argument. I think you won't have libertarians make that argument. I don't know. I think that's another re area where, where libertarian feminists would differ from a lot of mainstream feminists. But again, I think that that attitude is not as ingrained in sort of – Pro women issues, your feminist politics, as you would think. It's just sort of maybe maybe historically that was more true, and maybe that's been sort of a message that uh, liberal feminists have capitalized on. But I don't think that. Well, I think that one the one really good example that's been in the news relatively recently, in the last couple of years, is the gender pay gap, and that's something yeah. that that a lot of people say this pay gap exists due to a history of oppression and, and it, whether it's teachers not calling on girls enough, the kind of things you hear about and, and all those things added up to the point that women aren't assertive and they're not, they're not earning enough money. So this is something where the state needs to intervene. What, is the, what would the libertarian sort of feminist say to that? I think that's a, that's a good area to point out ways that 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 sort of thing could backfire because there are you know I mean one of the critique the critique from from either gender standpoint on this is just that you know that sort of thing will actually create you know market incentives that will actually harm women in the long run um, kind of like some of the anti discrimination statutes and things like that and so if when you can find reasons why I mean and I'm not saying like look for reasons why this is harming women but I think you know there's a legitimate reason for, there's a legitimate tendency for libertarian women to look at that and say okay but how how is this actually going to play out? And when there are those unintended consequences, pointing them out is an important function of you know being a part of that kind of conversation. So it seems that possibly, uh, maybe slowly, we're getting we libertarians uh, are getting better at talking about many of these issues, and possibly that that's one of the things we need to be looking forward if we're going to change what young people are, are coming up, what what sort of things are. Behavior. Is there anything in particular that we should be focusing on that, that's that's being left out? Um, I mean, one of the, one of the things I think we've one of the things we've been talking about at Reason is you know um, transgender issues, and I think that's going to be a part of the conversation that we've kind of been not writing a lot on, and we're trying to kind of think about issues there and where there might be a libertarian perspective on some of those and because I think that's an issue that's really important to young to millennials. Can you expand on that a bit? Like how would what sorts of transgender issues No, would I can't be I can't really actually work. That's what we're kind of trying to figure out is like where in this conversation okay. is is there I mean and maybe there's not, but is there a you know kind of libertarian are there libertarian areas to consider here? Well, it seems because that it is something that's very much you know trans trans activism and stuff is very much it's you know it's gone from kind of an offshoot of LGBT rights to sort of its own sort of thing, and it's kind of worth looking at. Is is there any are there different issues to consider? And the, well, the one that always comes up is of course bathrooms, and uh, and again that's the kind of third way because transgender people have rights. Just like right. everyone. And, um, and so yeah. actually here's one. One of the first articles I wrote for Reason was about uh, bathrooms and why there aren't more gender neutral bathrooms because we were just talking about that and I was, I was looking at it. And um, it turns out that like a lot of states have laws on the books that require if you have two bathrooms that they can't be gender neutral, that you have to have one for a man and one for a woman. D.C. actually requires that they both be gender neutral. But most places are kind of actually preventing this. So I think you have a lot of people who come at that issue and are just like, oh, this is terrible. Why don't more places have gender neutral bathrooms? And like one of the reasons is because there's these crazy old state laws on the books that prevent it. So like that's just kind of you know one small area where a libertarian could look at you know an issue like that and be like, oh, maybe here's where we can interject you know a different perspective. But is that something that we should oppose in the sense of or what would the libertarian position be on this? Because I can see one of the reasons for this being that uh, at a predominantly male place where women might occasionally, let's say a, a, a male bar of some sort, a gay bar, let's just say a gay bar where women might show up occasionally, they may decide to just have one male bathroom which makes the women very uncomfortable to go into the, males, the male bathroom so that the state comes in and mandates both bathrooms. Would our solution be that – don't do it at all or, or – No, I mean yeah. I mean we're, what I was saying is we should just get out. I mean first of all, I think that a lot of places do want to have – because a lot of businesses are saying they would have gender neutral bathrooms because it does make more sense. So in the places that doesn't, no, they won't and it won't matter. I don't think the state should make them. I just think the state should also like remove the barriers from people. Yeah, people organizing their bathrooms however they want. <laughs> I think again, yeah, the, the position on this is just again 
uh, one of the compelling things about the libertarian position is is since we believe individuals have rights as being individuals, it, it can have us be on the forefront of things like LGBT issues and transgendered right. issues for that for that exact reason. Because well, yeah, and I mean, Reason Magazine has been like writing about you know gay rights and gay marriage being pro gay marriage when you, when way before you know either of the mainstream parties were. So like they have a long history of doing that. And I think that's kind of cool. To that's one issue where that's an example. So in in, in a general sense. Uh, how how have we figured out what libertarian feminism looks like? Uh, what is the approach? What does it have to offer? Um, I think that it's just a way of a way of approaching feminist issues without state coercion. It's a way of it's a way of looking at feminist issues through a libertarian mindset, and vice versa, looking at libertarian issues through a feminist mindset. And I think that. With both those things together, I mean, I think there's a lot of natural overlap between them. And when you come at issues with both of them, you're inevitably going to wind up in places that are kind of underrepresented right now in our landscape, which is very much, you know, focused on left-right divide and, you know, and that with feminism always being connected with a sort of more big government approach to things. But I think it doesn't have to be. And that's one of, one of the goals of libertarian feminists is to try and point that out. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.